Well, hello. It's time for another exciting episode of Pens in Use. This is the show where I talk about the fountain pens and inks that I've been using throughout the week. So, let's dive into it. If videos like this interest you, where I talk about fountain pens, both new and old, and at all price points, I would invite you to subscribe. And, just for you, I was doing some paperwork from school, and a bunch of it was piled on the couch right there, so I cleaned it off the couch just for you. So, what else do you, what do you do when uh, you get surprise guests and your house is a mess? Oh, hey, we're coming over in five minutes. You ready for us? <laughs> <laughs> so, you've just come into my house, so I had to clean up for you. So, uh, anyway, I that <laughs> let's, let's take a look at the pens before I say something stupid. <laughs> Alright, so these are the pens that I've been using throughout the week. From left to right, we have a Lamy 80, Rex Pen 2002, a Lamy 2000, my Opera Vis, Visconti thingamajiggy, <laughs> Schaefer Legacy 2, uh, Waterman Hemisphere, no, sorry, sorry, Waterman Karen, a Senator Silver Fox, which is probably going to be here for a few more weeks, uh, Lamy Safari, Gehas 714, and finally the Nakaya Decapod Twist. So those are the pens. Let's see how they write in this cognitive surplus seafood journal thingy. If you've been watching this channel for a while, you know that the very first, the pen that I write to date with is always my very first pen. And this one's a doozy. This is a Lamy 80, which definitely shows some signs of Lamy 2000 design. It's an L on the finial, other finial nothing. You can, you can more clearly make out where the, the piston is. It's a slip cap, which I appreciate. Um, then the nib is this wonderful double broad gold nib. So, uh, yeah, definitely a fun pen to write with. Not really a business-like pen because it's it's so broad. It lays down way too much ink. But uh, fun. So this is a good one for writing in letters and such. Uh, the ink in it, I just emptied this out of another pen. And like I've, Aroshi, I misspelled it, Zuku, <laughs> just emptied it out of another pen. And, uh, you know, one of my goals has been to reduce the number of inks I have. So uh, this being a small bottle is an easy target and a fun target. Because I really like this ink. There are other inks I like just as well that are the same color. So, you know. It's not like I'm wedded to this one. So I won't be sad when I empty this one out. It'll be, it'll be a joyous celebration. You know, I've used up the ink. Uh, I get to use another fun ink in that color family. And uh, I'm happy. <laughs> so, nothing against Orochizuku. I just happen to want to get rid of some ink bottles. <laughs> Alright, my next pen was my first impression this week. It was a Rex Pen 2002. A uh, pen I've had floating around for a while. I just have not been able to talk myself into writing with it. Oh, and uh, I learned, I guess I should have realized this. This stands, this is, uh... okay, so it turns out it was on Instagram, not YouTube, where I got the comment. Uh, Skopje, I think I'm pronouncing that right is the uh, name here. That's the capital of Macedonia. And then here, uh, according to this comment on uh, Instagram, of course, he says that the other word literally means junkyard. So he's wondering if the pen is, uh, and he is apparently Macedonian, <laughs> he's wondering if the pen is actually from the company that collects the trash in, in uh, Skopje. And yes, I am going to try to fix that box at some point when I'm feeling brave. All right, so we'll give it a twirl. And open it up. 
It does have a very nice nib. And I, I mentioned I've been using this as my backup daily writer. This is kind of a nice pen, a, a very pleasant surprise. And I should have known that because this isn't my first rodeo with Rex pen. That's probably a fine nib. And the ink in it, of course, is Parker Quink Washable Blue. It has corrected a lot of tests this week also. What? You use blue ink on a test? Yeah, or red ink, or green ink, or purple ink. Whatever it is I'm carrying. You want to have fun, <laughs> fun in air quotes, uh, discuss whether teachers should use red ink or whether it's too harmful to the self-esteem of students uh, with, with a group of teachers. And oh boy, you can have some fun with that. That uh, sometimes ends up being quite a tear on uh, the fountain pen forums every so often. Somebody brings that up and boy, oh boy, is that get rough. Need my coffee. <laughs> All right, this next pen, good. I was hoping it would do this. This is a Lamy 2000. I have been noticing I'm getting a lot of condensation on the section. You know, just water, but it's like, is it evaporating out of the pen? What is up with that? And, and I don't know the answer. So this is a Lamy 2000. Uh, has a fine nib in it, and the ink in it is Califolio Noir, which is a meh kind of black ink. I like Califolio. I don't know, for some reason this black just doesn't do it for me. I did have uh, a viewer suggest to me in the comments last week that made me laugh that life's too short to use ink you don't like, just dump it down the sink. And you got a point, I've, I've got lots of ink. It just feels so wasteful to throw ink down the sink. I, I don't know, but, <clears throat> excuse me, but it also seems silly to have this much ink, so... <laughs> I'm not sure where I fall on that, <clears throat> but I, w I will say I will not get to this point ever again. Learned my lesson. All right, so this pen is the Visconti that I couldn't remember its name when I was going through it because I think of it as a Visconti Elements Air, but it's not. It's a Visconti Gold Point Number no. 1. You can check out Stephen Brown's channel for an actual Opera Elements, but he doesn't have the Air. He has a, I don't remember what. I think it's the red one. So this is a Visca... Oh, we should look at the nib. Because the nib is different than Stephen Brown's also. So this is a 18 karat gold nib. A, okay. <laughs> I guess that's better. We've got more carats. Visconti. Opera. Because it does say opera on it. And then uh, gold point number one. Has a medium nib in it. And I think I mentioned last week, I just mailed off a thank you letter to her. Uh, a viewer sent me a new bottle of Colorverse. Oops. Sorry about that. Colorverse Jupiter Flyby. And see, if I was a professional, I would reshoot that scene. But I'm not a professional. I'm just going to keep going. If I was a professional, maybe I could make better ink swatches, too. I do this, by the way. <clears throat> I'm showing vertical and horizontally how it fills out. And then this shows uh, line variation. Like, well, you can see it here. Let me put the pen down so I can pick this up. You can kind of see it here with the Lamy 80 that the cross strokes are narrower than the down strokes. So that's why I do that. Um, it doesn't really show, like if it's an oblique nib that's cut at an angle, that doesn't show that as well. 
but uh, overall it just shows a wider range. So there, there is a method to my madness. I'm just, not just some crazy guy like, oh, what can I do as a fun swatch that nobody else does? <laughs> well, that's why I do it that way. My next pen was a wonderful find from uh, Van S Pens. Um, apparently it had just been sitting in, they call it grandpa's basement, that just sitting in storage for years. But it was a very incredible pen set. I mean, check out my review of it. And uh, I got it for a very incredible price because if I try to buy a new one right now, it would be a much, much, much more expensive pen. So this is a Schaefer. Oh, did we look at the beautiful nib yet? So it's a Schaefer Legacy 2. As a medium nib, I know when I bought this pen, I was a little disappointed because I wanted uh, one of the black plastic ones. Okay, I'm crazy, but you know that this was all they had, and I don't like metal pens, but it doesn't bother me because my I'm not on that slick metal with my grip, so uh, it's fine. I, I've actually enjoyed this pen very much. This ink is Iro Shizuku which you saw last week in a pen with an oblique nib, now that I think about it. Hiroshizuku Mirosaki Shikabu. Can you tell that I don't have a proper set with sound insulation? That was a motorcycle that just went by. Again, not a professional YouTuber. I'm just a guy having fun with pens and sharing it with people. So this is just a fun pen to write with. Not a lot of flex to it, but it puts down a good line. I mean, I think it's making this ink look very good. And this ink, of course, is a Japanese poet. So, there you go. Let's just look last. Yeah, last week. Um, there. I used it in an oblique broad nib. And my next pen... A Waterman Karen. I think I uh, showed off the finish last week. I, was I using this pen last week? I don't even remember. Oh, I was. Okay. Waterman Karen. Oh, I remember now. Because I wrote Watermans, and that's actually, they don't go by Watermans now. They go by Waterman. Karen. has a broad nib, which was very hard to find. And it's an inlaid nib. I don't know, was somebody mentioned, is, is it a skinny pen? Let me uh, write the name of the ink before I forget what it is. And then I'll, we'll just take a quick look. So diamine, skull and roses. So I'm not going to put this pen up to every single pen that I have here, but uh, I'll put it next to a couple of the common ones. Because, uh, I don't know, somebody uh, in the comments mentioned, oh, it's one they'd kind of like to have, but they're worried it'll be too thin for them. And I know this person's taste in pens, so he's not going to have a lot of your really exotic pens, so... You know, none of this crazy Eastern European stuff for him. So here it is next to a Lamy 2000. Here it is next to the uh, Lamy Safari. Sorry, I drew a complete blank there what the name of the pen was. So about the same, maybe a little wider, but uh, without the tripod grip. Here it is, although it's not inked up. This is a pen that's out because I have somebody who might be interested in buying it from me. Here it is next to a Twisby 580 aluminum. And what else do I have here? Oh, Parker Vector. Heck yeah. I think everybody and their uncles used one of those. So, <laughs> that's a skinny pen. 
And do I have anything else here that's real common? I've, I've got several pens laid out to review. Oh, an Esterbrook. I don't know if he would own a vintage pen or not, but in case he does. Oops. There it is next to an Esterbrook. Uh, this is a, I call it the Senator Silver Fox. I like this pen a lot. Uh, even though I had to make up a name for it. Okay, and the ink in it is Pelican 4001 Royal Blue. It looks a little darker than it should because I have been, I will admit, I've been heavily favoring that Rex pen this week and I have not used this pen nearly as much as I normally would. In fact, the Rex pen is almost empty, so I may be back to the Silver Fox. All right, speaking of foxes, that's what's in this pen. This is my Lamy Safari. I've been using it to address envelopes. So make of that what you will. So this has a fine nib in it. It actually came with a silver nib. And this is one of my early pens that I bought. So I replaced it with a black nib, which I honestly, I think just looks a lot sharper. Um, the pen is okay. It's not one of my favorites. That's why it's relegated to using inks like this on envelopes because uh, it holds a very good seal for, you know, as unexciting as it may be. And I want to take a moment with two of the inks I've already shown you and just show off a little bit of sheen. Let's see if the camera can pick it up. So the first one is going to be in this Waterman Karen, this Diamine Skull and Roses. You might be able to pick up a little sheen there. Uh, maybe. And then surprisingly, if you can tell, this Pelican because it has dried out a little bit on the nib, was also doing a little bit of sheen. Okay, my next pen is a Geha Futura. Um, this got carried with me to school a few days as backup writer too. This one, ooh, this one had a little leaky around the nib. This one, is filled with a cartridge because Geha used cartridges. I've never found a converter for them. Um, so they have proprietary cartridges just to make it fun. So Geha Futura 714 with a steno nib. And the ink in it is a Roshizuku Yu Yake. Uh, you're going to see a lot of Yu Yake. I'm planning to film a video later today. I want to get this one published because I'm late on this. But I'm filming a video later today where I'm going to be comparing some pens. And this ink is what I have already loaded them with. And my last pen. Which, uh, weirdly enough, in this selection of pens has been neglected quite a lot this week. I've written with it a little, but not a whole lot. Is my Nakaya Decapod Twist. Luckily, it is as good a pen as it looks. And this, like the Visconti you saw earlier, is one of those pens that you funded uh, through watching these videos, because that's the advertising dollars. 
Uh, the Inconet is the coolest. <laughs> Sorry, has the coolest bottle of any ink in my collection. This is Ackermann Grünmarkt Smaragd. So kind of a darker green. I I, I like it. I was just watching a video this week. I want to say it was Lamy Green. And the person in it made the comment that nobody uses Lamy inks. And uh, I thought, well, I've got Lamy inks. But it's true, I don't. But anyway, the Lamy Green in it was kind of cartoonish. But it, at the same time, he found some very interesting character in it. That was the channel An Ink Guy. At least I think it was Lamy Green. I think it was this week. <laughs> I don't know. Um, most of my YouTubing I do in the morning. Like as I'm cooking breakfast or, you know, if, if I do it at other times of the day, it's while I'm uh, cleaning house or something. So, not always paying the best attention. So, <laughs> uh, tell me what I was doing then. I might remember more precisely. But anyway, um, those are the pens and inks that I've been using this week. All right, so those are the pens and inks that I've been using this week. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but the last couple of weeks I've been wearing some new shirts because I was forced to buy some because, uh, you know, when, when you're getting dressed and your elbow comes through the sleeve, it's like, okay, yeah, time for that shirt to go. So, uh, yeah, I've had to do some replacing of shirts, so I finally bought a few. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I, I hate clothes buying, and uh, we used to have, a well, two stores here in town where I could buy clothes. Not like they had a huge selection, but they had clothes, and uh, neither of them exists anymore. The joys of small town life, because uh, that was long before the pandemic. But anyway, in uh, other exciting news, I was, uh, well, I, I thought of this topic after I uh, ended last week's video, but I, I mentioned what a debacle that was, and I, you know, I was like, I was going to do this unboxing for you. And uh, so the unboxing I was going to do, a lot of it was books that I'd bought. And uh, I, I know I have talked about this before, and I've done a driving video or two on it, but, uh, you know, paper books, um, electronic books. Do you like, I know this is going to have a picture of me. Do you read on this? Do you read on your iPad? Um, what do you do? So, uh Anyway, I just found that kind of interesting. Um, I don't like to read on my phone. Uh, was, I was actually talking about this with one of my colleagues yesterday. You know, we're neither of us, like, you might check your email on the phone, especially if you're out somewhere, but I'm not going to compose a reply on that unless it's, like, really important and is quick. Uh, I'm going to wait till I can get to a computer and type it with a keyboard. I uh, don't really like staring at the screen on it. If I'm going to watch a video or something, or if I'm going to read something, I prefer to do it on my computer screen. I just, the phone is too small. It's a tool, but I, I don't get the kids who are so addicted to the damn things. Uh, they're, <laughs> there's such better tools out there. Uh, the, the good thing with this is uh, it's portable. So this was actually with me on my hike last week. I went to, uh, in fact, this will probably be in next week's Pens and Use. I went to the Cave Hills down to Slim Butte and explored there. And this was kind of nice for filming video. Because I didn't want to hike with a tripod. I didn't want to hike with a, a lot of gear. I did take that camera, uh, but not a tripod. So this was a good way to get video footage of it. So it, it has its uses. It's portable. Um, but it's not really the best tool for every job. Uh, as far as reading, if I travel, I like to have something with me to read. I, uh, you know, if it's just a quick trip, you know, a book is fine. But say I'm staying somewhere for a week or more, or it's just not convenient to bring a book, that's where I like ebooks. Uh, and I don't like to read them on a computer screen. I like e-ink, like on a 
a Barnes & Noble Nook or an Amazon Kindle. or I have a Books Nova 3 because I get both with that. I, uh, I'd just much rather read it there. And uh, the nice thing with the Books Nova 3, by the way, is I can read in the dark, like at night. I, I It's got a little, I guess it's not a backlight, front light. Anyway, I, I can read when it's dark. So, you know, when I want to stay up late, I can read. Uh, so I'm in bed, really. I'm being good, but I'm reading. Would have been a lot easier to have one of those when I was a kid. I get in trouble for that sometimes. But anyway, <coughs> excuse me. Um, but... I don't know, there's just something about a paper book. But at the same time, then you have them. Uh, well, libraries are good, although I haven't been librarying, librarying this past year because of the pandemic. L libraries are good because you can read a book once like, okay, I'm glad I read that. I'll never read it again. But other books you just want. and I don't know, I like having them. And some of them are references. Some of them you know you're going to read again. Uh, like, I, I'm going to reread Hyperion, the Hyperion Cantos. I'll reread Dune again. Um, so, I like that. And and I also like that Amazon and Barnes and & Noble can't just go, whoop, we're taking those away from you now. Like, let's just say, Am not that it's too likely, but Amazon goes under. What happens to all those Amazon books that are now on my Kindle app? Um... I don't know <laughs> if Amazon goes under and I've purchased any of these books from there, which I might have. I'm trying not to buy books from them, but you know, once in a while I do. Uh, if I've bought one of those books from them, what happens? Nothing. I have the book. So uh, it's kind of a win um, to have the physical books. And the other thing I like with physical books is I can buy them used, which I do a lot. Um, I'm probably lucky I don't live closer to a used bookstore because I would probably spend more money on books. But uh, every so often I find myself on Biblio.com and uh, end up with weeks like last week where I have a whole bunch of new to me used books arriving in the mail. And so I, uh, I guess I'm, I'm more on the side of paper, but as far as the clutter thing, I do see some good in uh, eBooks. Uh, I'm going to mention one other thing which would be textbooks. Uh, I dis I've, what I'm seeing in the teaching world is a lot more of publishers focusing on ebooks. And uh, some of them you can't even get a paper version of a book. Uh, there's a physical science textbook I really like, although they now seem to have gone out of business, uh, that switched entirely to ebooks and then a couple of years later they just disappeared. I'm not sure if there's any connection or if it had to do more with uh, the original crew that wrote the first edition of the book back in the 60s, finally aged out of the thing. I don't know. But anyway, the important thing is textbooks. So, uh, you know, with the pandemic and everything, and my, the school where I teach is one-to-one -one with devices. We have uh, Microsoft Surfaces. I uh, had all my materials online. And uh, I used OneNote mainly as my platform. So I'd put the instructions for labs on OneNote. I'd have the lab template there, all that stuff. Uh, they'd take their notes on OneNote. And the nice thing with a Surface and OneNote is you can hand write your notes. But a uh, couple of things. It's convenient because you can just pass it out. There's no paper involved. You don't have to cut photocopy. Uh, if you have kids who are online, it's no different for them. They have it because thanks pandemic, we've got to have kids online and in the classroom. But uh, the other thing that it creates is it creates a automatic distraction for kids. You know, if I'm teaching, we're a paper pencil world. I can say, hey, put that phone away. Hey, you don't need that computer open. But if they're using the computer for class, now they've got the computer open and you don't know what they're doing. You know, you try to migrate around the room, although with the pandemic, I do a lot less of that too. Um, 
but you don't know what they're doing and, and kids are quick they'll just switch between apps real fast and uh so there's a lot of distractions built into those the other problem that comes up with devices they just seem to work slower uh kids i mean not the devices kids just I, and it could be the distraction thing but kids are just slower working with their when they work with their devices so uh anyway i finished up a chapter in my oh yeah one other thing uh that i don't like with the devices so you do a lab you've got your lab instructions open you've got your notebook open you, they're side by side you go back and forth with your eyeballs it's all good when you're on the computer screen you could try to do the side by side thing but everything then is cramped and uh a lot of kids just don't do that so then you're switching back and forth between different pages constantly and one of the things i saw more and more with uh being electronic they just don't read the instructions for the lab and uh so anyway i just i was going to go back to paper for next year but uh I'd finished a chapter in two different classes and I decided to hell with it or go on paper for the rest of the year. I will figure out the online people. I mean, I've got the stuff made for online. I'm just printing it off now. And uh, I think it will go better. We'll see. But uh, I was in a... When I was in college, and one of these days I want to do a video on it before the computer quits working. When I was in college, I went to a college that uh, was one of the early adopters of one-to-one -one computers. In fact, I was it was my freshman year where they became that. So I was the first class to have a computer. It was a compact Contura 4C, I think. You know, had 4 megabytes of RAM, 130 megabyte hard drive. Uh, yeah, 256 color screen. And uh, later I got the memory expanded to 8 megabytes. Ooh. But what I remember, it was nice to be able to type papers on it because I didn't have to use a typewriter or go to the computer lab or something. Um, but I know a lot of the professors complained that people were playing games on them uh, during class. Now, back then you couldn't get on the internet with those things. But uh, you could sure do games and be off task. And uh, that was a thing a lot of professors didn't like with them. In fact, there were a lot of professors who would say, you cannot use that in, in class. And uh, we're still facing the same problem with them. So uh, I know the pandemic really pushed me to the electronic side. But I'm ready to pull back. I'm not getting rid of the computers. I am on the committee that chose those devices. But I'm ready to say, hey, it's a tool. There is a time and a place for it. There's a time and a place to put it away. And uh, I will just say I don't like this trend of textbooks being online. Uh, yes, there's a lot you can do with that. You know, you can have translations that way. You can have the textbook read to you if that's necessary. Um, but... It just creates an extra distraction at the same time. So, uh, But at the same time, you see the size of some of the textbooks that are out there, and you're just like, oh my god, that's like bigger than the kid. So there is that problem, too. Because dirty little secret, although it's probably a pretty open secret, we don't finish the textbook. We look at that giant honking thing, and we pick and choose what we're going to teach out of it. And then we're like, oh, I really don't like how they did that chapter on momentum. So I'm going to teach it my way. And, uh, I mean, there are teachers that just teach straight from the textbook. Don't get me wrong, but we don't teach out of the whole thing. And that's a benefit of the electronic because they're a lot lighter. So, anyway, that's enough of me rambling. I... I don't know, is it a Wasky Squirrel video if I don't say something controversial? Um, well, thank you for watching. And if videos like this interest you, where I talk about fountain pens, both new and old, and at all price points, I would invite you to subscribe. And 
you know, I guess I brought up a couple of topics, controversial or not. Like, do you panic when somebody says, Hi, I want to come over in five minutes. Because um, I'm not ready. <laughs> How are you? And, um, I don't know, ebooks versus regular books. I know I've asked that before, but that's always interesting. So, uh, well, let us know down in the comments. So, as always, I want to thank you for watching. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.